All right, so this is one of our not so good friends of the forest. This is kudzu, and if you've been around living in the south for all your life, then you probably know what kudzu is. If you haven't lived in the south all your life, then you may not be that fortunate or unfortunate, depending on your outlook. Kudzu is an invasive species that was introduced from uh, Japan and it first made its way to the United States via the World Expo in 1876 as an ornamental. It was later planted by the US Department of Agriculture as a method of preventing erosion and it worked great for that. They used it along road right of ways and uh, railroad rights of way and in the process of planting this plant, no one had any idea what it was going to do as far as its ability to take over. And you can look and you can see how it's everywhere here. But that's what it does. It takes over. That's what invasive species do is they tend to uh, be able to spread quite well due to conditions that are similar to the place where they came from. If we were to look at uh, latitude of the place where kudzu is originally from, it's very similar to that that we have here in North Carolina. And this is what allows it to persist so well. And if you go into the higher latitudes toward in the north, about the farthest south that you'll see kudzu is in Pennsylvania, or excuse me, furthest north. Um, you won't see it beyond that just because it gets too cold for it. But kudzu, despite the fact that it's invasive and a pain, um, it's an interesting plant uh, otherwise. So it's a member of the pea family. And if we look here, you can see these, these fruit here, these bean-like fruits. Okay, and this is how it reproduces, and this is why it's in the pea family, because it has a pea-type fruit. Okay, here's a, here's a remnant of the flowers, these purple blossoms here that you see. Those are the, the flowers of kudzu. Um, as I mentioned had previously, okay, it has what we call a ternately compound leaf. So that means there are three leaflets. Okay, and it's quite a complex plant as far as its growth pattern. Okay, because it's actually considered to be a woody vine. And when we're talking about something that's a vine, that means it's trailing, has the ability to climb and attach itself to other things using something called tendrils. And these long stems here, okay, if you look out here at the end, it has this little twisted tip right here. Okay, that's a tendril. And that tendril allows it to grab and grip a hold on other things. And remember we were talking about leaves. Okay, vines are the same way as other woody plants. Okay, this leaf is coming out from a little spot here and where this leaf falls off is where a new leaf will grow or just above it okay uh, their buds for the next year's growth are not very well defined on this but kudzu can grow anywhere uh, or up to a foot a day and that's how vigorous it is and depending on how sunny or shady it is will determine how fast it grows Okay, but in really good sunny spots, this stuff will absolutely go wild. And that's what you see here. It's absolutely going nuts because this is a really nice sunny spot. Okay, but this is kudzu. You can, it, it, this one commonly gets confused with poison ivy, particularly in shady areas because both have this ternately compound leaf. Okay, and they have a similar structure in that the terminal leaflet, that's what the one on the top is called, the terminal leaflet. Okay, it has a long petiole similar to what you see here. Okay, so pretty interesting. All right, so here we have another really interesting tree. Okay, this is called black gum. So we had sweet gum that we had over on the other part of the trail. This is black gum. Okay, and it's a totally uh, different plant. It's in a different family.
okay and the leaves are different than the other one this one has pinnate venation you can see that by looking down the mid rib of the leaf which is the center center part there and then look at the this vein spacing okay which are kind of alternate from each other but they're all coming off of the same mid rib okay so this is pinnately veined okay this is black gum has what we call an entire leaf and that refers to the margin of the leaf the margin is smooth and that it doesn't have any teeth or anything like that but out at the end it has this little tip here okay this is called a drip tip or a muckernate tip and as water flows over the leaf surface it will collect at the tip and from there that water will drip off um, down to the ground usually out along the fringe of the, of the outside of the tree which is where the root extensions are okay so it's a way of watering the root system but black gum is notable because it has these uh, blue fruit that are edible um, to many different uh, animals so it's important wildlife food black gum also produces some of the best fall color in the forest of the southern Appalachians and here's a leaf it's already starting to turn here okay but most black gum leaves will turn a bright bright red once they get finished um, changing color um, that will be their final color is bright red and it's because of the anthocyanins that are found in the leaves and you can see these are already starting to turn they're starting to get some little purple spots on them and that is because fall is coming we may be in for a uh, an early fall this year okay but black gum is interesting also because of its branches the branches generally grow perpendicular to the stem so at 90 degrees is how the limbs grow out from the main trunk of the tree and mature black gum has a kind of a blocky uh, bark pattern and if we see uh, one that's a little bit older than this one I'll try to point that out but uh, really interesting plant. They also call it um, Mountain Tupelo is another name for it. Black gum. So this is what we call a look-alike plant right here. Okay, it looks like a maple. Okay, so here's got this one. Then we move right over here. Okay, we got the same what looks to be the same thing okay see the leaves here maple shaped okay this is red maple here okay this over here though is something different this is not a maple at all this is called maple leaf viburnum and it's named that because the leaves look just like a maple they're not even in the same family okay although they are both opposite leaved, opposite branched. So if you notice that right there, you can see that the leaves come off of the same node, okay, opposite of each other, just like red maple. Okay, this one is just a shrub. So shrubs generally don't grow very tall, and shrubs most of the time have multiple uh, stems growing up from their root crown. So you generally have most of the time three or more uh, individual stems that come up from the ground once this matures um, whereas a tree is going to usually be a singular stem unless it's growing from a stump sprout and then there may be more than one but most of the time their trunks are singular but maple leaf viburnum is an important wildlife shrub again it is like black gum it produces bluish berries and deer and other things, uh, wild turkey will eat those blue berries. Uh, they're not really good for human consumption. They just don't taste very good. But other things besides humans will eat them. So it's a very important plant. But again, the, the resemblance to red maple is uh, quite striking. And why it's one of the reasons why it often gets confused with red maple because of its similarities. All right, here's another important woodland species. Okay, this is called muscadine grape. Okay, muscadine grape is the North Carolina state fruit. 
okay, because it is native to North Carolina. And in here in the western part of the state, the muscadines are purple. If you go down in the eastern part of the state, they call them scuppernongs. And scuppernongs are more of a yellowish color. But again, it has a vine. It's what I call a trailing vine. And these things, right here's one that's trying to wrap a tendril, okay? But these things are able to climb up into trees. And what they'll do, actually, rather than climb, most of the time they'll attach themselves to a small tree that's usually about the height of the same height as them. Okay, in the case, this case, they've attached themselves to this white oak, but they will use that white oak to ride up into the canopy. So whatever they're attaching themselves to is what will take them higher up so that they can maximize the amount of sunlight that they um, can get and photosynthesize. And these produce great tasting purple colored uh, fruit. They're a popular food for deer and turkeys and all kinds of things like that. And I am getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. They're having their way with me right at the moment. All right, here's a important woodland species. This is called hickory. Okay, this is pignut hickory and you should be able to tell me what kind of leaf this has. Okay, it is a compound leaf. Okay, here's the leaflets. Okay, this one has one, two, three, four, five leaflets. Okay, if we look close at the stem, we can see its connection. Okay, so it's opposite leaved. Okay, you can see the buds. Okay, right if you look very carefully there where the leaf axles are. Okay, these are next year's buds. Okay, it has a terminal bud, which is this thing out here at the end. Okay, that's the bud that will come out next year and where new growth will come from is this uh, grows in the spring. But hickory is an important species because it shares dominance with oaks. Hickories and oaks are the last things to colonize a forest. So when a forest reaches maturity, or what we call climax in ecological terms, hickories and oaks are the, the biggest things that will be in the woods. They make up the largest part of the canopy, okay? These are what we call mast trees, so they produce nuts, okay? And hickory nuts are mostly not edible except to things like squirrels and other rodents. That's generally what eats hickory nuts because the, the uh, nuts very hard and um, not easy to get into, unlike acorns, which are much easier for things to eat. Hickory actually is a replacement species for the American chestnut. So when chestnuts grew here, before the blight impacted them, they were the dominant species along with oaks. And um, as, when the blight took them out, the hickories grew in their place and filled that ecological niche that was no longer occupied by the American chestnut. So if something happens to the hickories, that's not gonna be a good thing because we have no idea what the replacement will be. But compound leaf, okay, and opposite leaved, okay? Another common shrub to the forest here, the Dittmer Watts, and throughout the Southern Appalachians, particularly in acidic woods, is mountain laurel. And that's what this shrub is here. This is mountain laurel. This blooms about in the mid-spring, usually in May is when this begins to bloom. And these are the fruit of mountain laurel, but the flowers are really much more interesting than the fruit in that the, they have what we call spring-loaded stamens. The stamens are tucked in pockets on the plant or on the flower, and when a pollinator lands on them, they turn loose, and they're like little springs, and they dust the insect with pollen. And if you notice on these, you can actually see this thing here, this is the pistil, okay, that's left over from those flowers, okay, and this is the, the ovary that has been likely fertilized, okay, and then down below there 
you actually see the sepals, okay, which would have been the things that would have covered the petals, and those uh, have since uh, uh, long dropped off, okay, but these are ready to open and pretty soon and will drop seed and you'll have more Mount Laurel coming up. Here's another shrub that's found here at the Dittmer Watts uh, Park. And this is related to Mount Laurel. Okay, they're both in the Heath family. Okay, this one blooms in July or late or mid-June to, to mid-July. Actually, it's probably a better way to term it. But uh, this is the, the fruit of the rhododendron. Okay, you can see these little things that jut out here. Often this one, for some reason, gets confused with magnolia. And I guess it's because the leaves are evergreen and um, look, they're kind of big like magnolia leaves might be. Uh, Mount Laurel is also... Uh, evergreen so both of these shrubs and here's Mount Laurel right over here both of these shrubs are evergreen species common to the forests of the southern Appalachians and they generally give us a good idea of the type of soil that's found there because they grow in acidic soils so these are the, the most common shrubs that you have here in this particular area Okay, here's an interesting vine. This is called Biltmore Carrion Flower. Okay, and Biltmore Carrion Flower used to be a rare species in North Carolina. But thanks to some work of uh, myself and a colleague finding tons of it here in Hickory Nut Gorge, it's no longer listed as rare because we found that it's actually... Um, fairly commonplace in most acidic forests. There just wasn't a lot known about the plant prior to that. But carrion flowers are interesting because the flowers that they produce um, smell like rotting meat and attract flies. And so, uh, it, again, it grows as a vine. This one is not as uh, prolific as far as a grower as some other uh, species of carrion flower. Some species uh, that are similar to this, um, they, they go by the, the genus Smilax. Some have um, uh, briars or little prickles and uh, will skin you up pretty bad if you uh, uh, happen to walk into a thicket of them. Okay, but this one does not have those and uh, it's alternate. Let's see, wait a minute. Yeah, it's alternate leaved, okay? It doesn't look like it when you look up at the, at the top of it. It almost looks opposite. But what it is is the nodes are so close together that they appear to be opposite. But in reality, it's alternate leaved, okay? But this is Biltmore carrion flower. Okay, here you find the leaves of a Fraser magnolia. That's what this plant is. Again, this is one that has kind of a different um, growth pattern. Okay, it's um, actually considered, I believe, to be alternate. But if you look real closely at the leaf scars, and I'm not sure how well that's coming into focus. Um, it's not doesn't look like it's so great, but anyway when you look at the leaf scars on this they are alternate from each other But they grow very close together and Notice it has this terminal bud here Okay, and these are what we call a bivalve bud and that they will open um, along a Common seam and it has two scales one on both sides and then the new growth will come up from that but the leaves of Fraser Magnolia are what we call auriculate, okay? In other words, they have these little growth things here on them that look like earlobes, okay? And your, another name for your earlobe is, is called an auricle, A-U-R-I-C-L-E, okay? So that's what these are. These are auriculate leaves, okay? And it is, would be said to be entire because it doesn't have any teeth along the margins of the leaves. It is pinnately veined, okay, 
and is considered to be a simple leaf. So this is not compound, it is a simple leaf. Fraser Magnolia. Okay, here is flowering dogwood. This is the North Carolina state flower. Okay, also is pinnately veined. Okay, but the nation is a little bit different and it has these kind of, it kind of curves. Okay, dogwood is opposite leaved, opposite branched. Okay, you can see the branching pattern here. Okay, then if you look up here on the stem, okay, you can see, well, I swat the mosquitoes again. Okay, you can see that it's opposite leaved and I can't get, there it goes. Get a little bit clearer there. So opposite leaved, opposite branch, again, simple leaves. And I don't know how well you can see it, but up above me, okay, is um, the dogwood has these berries on it. Okay, they're red berries. And actually, I'm mean, probably do better look at some of the ones on the ground. Okay, here's a berry. These are the berries from the dogwood, and these are um, very important fruit for many of the things that live out here, particularly um, tropical birds. Um, I don't know how well I can get this to come into focus. Let me set it on the ground there just a second. There we go. But uh, the uh, migratory birds that come through our area rely heavily on dogwood berries, dogwood and magnolia um, fruit because of the high amounts of protein and fat and carbohydrates that they have which allow them to make that long journey back to Central America which is where they will overwinter before returning back to our area in the spring. So very very important fruit. And for, this is uh, for American dogwood. And here we'll find our nemesis, poison ivy. There's tons of it in here, along with the mosquitoes. Okay, and what about this? Here's something else growing right here amongst the poison ivy. Our good friend, the grape fern, okay, that we met in our, on our last trip. Okay, this one, the spores are a little bit more developed. Okay, and remember we talked about that the spores are kept on these little ball-like structures called sporangia okay this is a fertile frond this is the sterile frond okay and if you look down at the ground okay um where it's in the ground let's see how well this okay it looks like both stems are coming up directly from the soil okay but in reality they are attached just beneath the surface okay and that gives them the appearance that there's two stems but they're actually one Okay, we know this is grape fern by the look of the leaves. Okay, and if this were rattlesnake fern, it would be more dissected, and it wouldn't be, it would not have its fertile frond at this time if it were rattlesnake fern. Okay, but right here, this is poison ivy. Okay, this is three leaves or three leaflets. Okay, one, two, three, and you notice it looks like a small version of kudzu at this stage, but as kudzu gets bigger, the leaves look a little different. Uh, poison ivy tends to have a few more teeth um, than, it, than, than kudzu would, okay, although some of them do appear to be more um, entire rather than being lobed but you need to get to know this plant poison ivy never gets as big as kudzu okay and often it will grow in weedy areas like this where we're at this is like a jungle in here all kinds of invasive species in here such as honeysuckle and privet and um, um, mimosa so all kinds of things that really don't Along here, but you can see there's poison ivy all over the ground here. It grow, generally grows as a vine, but will clamber along the ground and almost look like a shrub because it tends to be rather thick sometimes where it's growing. But um, it's a native species, and what makes it so bad is it has a oil in it 
that uh, will make you, when it comes in contact with your skin, it will make you break out with a what they call a contact dermatitis. Okay, but you really need to get to know this plant. If you spend much time in the woods, okay, you will find very quickly that it is not one that you want to uh, mess around with. Okay, but especially if you're allergic. Some people are not allergic to it. Other people develop an allergy over a period of time, which is kind of what has happened to me. I'm not very allergic to it, but I can get it. Okay, so make sure you get familiar with poison ivy. That's what it, that is right there. Here's some really big poison ivy right here. These big, huge leaves. Look at that right there. That is that poison ivy, you know, just for scale, let me show you how big that is. Okay, so it's bigger, all three leaflets combined are bigger than my hand. Okay, so, uh, and I'm sure it's loaded with urichiol, which is the alkaloid that gives you the uh, rash when you get it on your skin. Okay, so stay out of the poison ivy patch. So all the best advice I can give you if I tell you anything that you learn learn it just to stay out of poison ivy not good okay this is an interesting plant called nut sedge it's actually a weed okay but it's interesting because it is a sedge for one thing and sedges are a little different okay they look like grasses so when you look at them okay they got these long blades okay like grass but when you look at their structure okay their stems are triangular okay so if you look at it in cross section it has a triangular stem whereas a grass would be round okay so grasses are round sedges are triangular and mints are actually square so if we were to find a mint it we would look and see that it has a square stem okay but the way to remember sedges is sedges have edges that's the best way Remember, these are these thing up here. These are the fruit of the nut sedge. Okay, there's kind of these spiky little ball things here. This is just a weed, so probably it got deposited when they were uh, planting out here. This whole place is full of all kinds of invasive uh, species, so uh, that's probably part of the reason why we see it out here. But it's common in areas that don't dry out very well. We're very close to a wetland, so it's probably why it's uh, picked this spot to grow.